I'd like to continue on my, uh, my discussion of economic myths. Uh, I guess I could call these interventionist myths. Uh, and, uh, and so I, I took on the big topic of the Great Depression uh, for this topic. And um, I think what I'd like to start with is uh, a discussion of what I call, uh, in my book on capitalism, called the, the American way of dealing with recessions. Because it was the way in which uh, Americans uh, uh, dealt in terms of economic policy with recessions or depressions really until the Great Depression of the 1930s. And that was uh, basically to either do nothing or to deregulate. Uh, that was basically what, 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 what was done uh, by most, uh, most uh, administrations, most uh, government administrations to deal with in, um, recessions. And uh, a good example of that is uh, uh, President Martin Van Buren who was president of the United States, uh, is elected in 1836. And uh, I'm going to read you just, just a couple of statements by Van Buren on his philosophy of what to do, because 1837, there was a big, a deep uh, recession, if not a depression, in, in the economy. So bad luck on his part. He gets elected, and, and this uh, recession uh, was just about to begin. And he said things like, all communities are apt to look to government for too much especially at periods of sudden embarrassment and distress. And he was referring to this depression. And he said, uh, moreover, all former attempts on the part of government to assume the management of domestic or foreign exchange had proved injurious, uh, end quote. And so uh, all, all former meddling interventionism as a response to recession uh, made things worse. And he said what was needed was, quote, a system founded on private interest, enterprise, and competition without the aid of legislative grants or regulations by law, end quote. And that was a president of the United States saying that. And, and so uh, he, and he, uh, his actions were consistent with his words, uh, as is not always the case. Um, as uh, you know, Ronald Reagan was a great speech maker, especially before he became uh, president, and, uh, but his actions were often different than his speeches. And it's the same is true of just about every president. But in Van Buren's case, he stuck to his rhetoric. And, uh, and there was financial market deregulation that, that he uh, supported and helped get passed. Uh, for example, there, were, uh, there was a law, uh, and Jeffrey Hummel, I read, I read about this, I didn't know about this, I read about this in Jeffrey Hummel's book that I've mentioned several times. There was a law actually that forced commercial banks to buy some of these worthless bonds that state governments issued to finance so-called internal improvement projects the ones that were championed by Abraham Lincoln in, in Illinois, for example. They actually got a federal law forcing these banks to buy these, these bonds, which turned out to be useless. And so Van Buren uh, was instrumental in getting rid of that. Uh, there, were, there were banking regulations that prohibited branch banking, in, uh, as there were in the modern era. And he understood that that was a bad idea, too. So there was actually was financial market deregulation. Van Buren was an advocate of hard money. And he helped uh, 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 the creation, the eventual creation in the early 1840s of what was called the independent treasury system, which made uh, currency redeemable in gold and silver. Um, uh, there, were no imp there were no pork barrel spending. He, he didn't do what modern presidents always have done, especially beginning with Roosevelt and Hoover, his predecessor is spend money like crazy on road building or canal building. He was opposed to the so-called internal improvements projects financed by taxes, and, uh, and, and he vetoed any bills that came across his desk to spend tax money on, on this sort of thing. There was no fe federal bailout of state governments, even though the state governments were uh, in pretty bad shape financially. Uh, the Van Buren administration cut federal spending in absolute dollars by 21%. From 1836 to 1840, the federal spending actually declined by uh, 21 percent. There were no price controls, and uh, he did what he could to move closer to free trade. He was a free trader and did, did what he could to open up trade. And so as a result, it was, it was a, a deep recession, but very short. It didn't last that long. And, and that was the Amer what I think of as the American way of dealing with recessions. Uh, they didn't do much. Uh, probably because macroeconomics hadn't been invented yet. That's probably the main, main reason that uh, there, there was, they had no, no philosophical rationale for doing otherwise. And plus, they had a lot of bad experience to point to, as Van Buren did, 
they, they might not have had a theoretical framework, but they had a, a lot of bad experience with interventionism. And so, well, anyway, Her Herbert Hoover, let's, I mean, I'm supposed to be talking about the Great Depression. Um, probably the biggest economic myth there is is that laissez-faire capitalism caused the Great Depression and uh, interventionism in the New Deal cured the Great Depression. Uh, false. Not true. Uh, the, the Hoover administration was anything but interventionist. Uh, and there was a great bit of, mo a, a lot of monetary expansion in the 1920s. The uh, money supply increased by almost 70% during that, during that decade. And I'll, I'll talk about the ramifications of that in a minute. But, you know, Herbert Hoover is credited with being a laissez-faire, advocate of laissez-faire capitalism. And if you read some of the things he wrote after he got out of office, they were, they were pretty good. They, you know, they could be published by the Mises Institute even. And, and of course, he used some of his wealth to help to found the Hoover Institution in California. But like a lot of other politicians, even, uh, I think we were talking last night, even Thomas Jefferson, uh, who was, you know, philosophically was great before he was president. But once he got in office, the, the pressures of politics changed him. You know, he, he, had, he had to, if he wanted to succeed as a politician, he had to compromise, and that's what politicians do. So he wasn't that good of a president in my eyes, but he was. But his political philosophy was was tremendous, uh, and the same is true with Hoover. But if you look at what he actually did and what he stood for policy-wise, it was interventionism. He was a progressive. He was not a he was not a capitalist, an advocate of laissez-faire. Uh, what did he do? Well, he pressured businesses to raise wages during when, when the economy was slowing down near the end of his his, uh, his term. Pressured. Now, when you say government pressures somebody, um, I think of it as uh, <coughs> uh, or negotiates with somebody. I always think of it as gun under the table negotiation. There's always some sort of hidden threat there. Either you do what I'm suggesting, or something bad's going to happen to you. Uh, you'll be audited. Or yeah, you know, I'll go. I'll sign this law that will tax, put a special excise tax on your industry, so, something like that. So when you when you you know when you negotiate with government, it's never an, an even negotiation. And so and he held hundreds of conferences, literally hundreds, with different trade groups, industry groups, to try to get them to raise wages. And this was essentially the agenda of labor unions that that Hoover was promoting. And all of this was codified during the Roosevelt administration by labor laws that changed. Uh, but so, in fact, in my book, I quote Rexford Tugwell, who was uh, FDR's chief economic advisor from 1932 to 1935, as saying that most of the ideas for the New Deal came from Herbert Hoover. They just, they just went further and codified in law a lot of the things that he was trying to get done somehow through pressure or persuasion uh, bribery, you know, threats, that's what politicians do. Uh, he, had, he also pleaded with business people to engage in uh, uh, work sharing, which is sort of a socialist idea of uh, instead of having 10 people working 40 hours a week, why don't you hire 20 people and have them work 20 hours a week? He thought that would reduce unemployment. But of course, the only way to reduce unemployment is through more production. Uh, that's the only way to do it. This is just rearranging the chairs in the Titanic. Uh, work sharing, sort of a socialistic idea. Um, uh, unlike Van Buren and other predecessors, uh, Herbert Hoover uh, started the, the binging on pork barrel public work spending. It wasn't Roosevelt that, that initiated this, it was Herbert Hoover. He spent 13% of the federal budget on public works alone in, in, the, in, in the first couple of years of his administration. And of course to do that he had to raise taxes enormously. Uh, so we had some of the biggest tax increases in American history up to that point uh, under Herbert Hoover. And uh, in Murray, Murray Rothbard's book, America's Great Depression, is a great resource on, uh, on Herbert Hoover. It's, it's a basically a, a, about the, the Hoover administration for the most part. And if you want to read up about all the tax increases and so forth, that's, that's where to find it. Uh, it was Hoover who started the business of farm government-supervised farm co cartels. The, the business of paying farmers to not grow food, uh, to not raise livestock, and so forth. That started with Her Herbert Hoover. Now, you don't have to be a, a PhD student in economics to understand that if the problem is unemployment, and the government is taking one big sector of the economy, farming, and is paying people not 
to hire farm workers and to not provide may, uh, grow food, that that's not going to be good for unemployment for reducing unemployment. <coughs> He's paying people to not hire farm workers. That's essentially what they were doing. Uh, that's why these these programs that continued in a much larger degree during the uh, FDR's administration uh, were a disaster for southern sharecroppers, especially low-income southern sharecroppers. When they cut back on agricultural production, uh, they were hurt uh, as hard as anyone during the Great Depression. There was massive unemployment among the southern sharecroppers because uh, fewer crops were being grown, and that was government policy for fewer crops to be grown because they wanted to raise the price of food. That was, the, that was FDR's intention. That was Hoover's intention. They had the cockamamie idea that the Great Depression was caused by low prices. Therefore, if we could just have high prices, the Depression will end. Just like that. That, that, was, that was basically the theory. Um, Hoover signed the Smoot-Hawley Tariff, which, uh, which should be called the Smoot-Hawley-Hoover Tariff because he initiated the whole thing. He went to Congress and said, we need to raise the tariff. Okay, we're in a recession. A recession is approaching. Therefore, what do we need to do? Cut off trade. Restrict, restrict economic activity even more. And so, uh, so he went to Congress, and then Smoot and Hawley, two members of Congress, uh, sponsored the bill. And this raised the average tariff rate to just under 60%, 60 percent, 60 percent. And as a result, there was an international trade war. Uh, the uh, the uh, volume of international trade by the uh, 75 top trading countries seven, uh, who engage in most of the world trade uh, fell uh, by about 80 percent in three years. American exports fell by 53 percent from 1929 to 1932 in, uh, in just really two years, because this was the end 1930, really, when this kicked in. And so that was quite the disaster that, that, uh, that, uh, that Hoover was responsible for. It really should be called the Smoot-Hawley-Hoover tariff. He also socialized investment by allocating billions of dollars to something called the Reconstruction Finance Corporation that would uh, uh, gave the government billions of dollars in investment uh, by, uh, through loan guarantees uh, primarily. So the government got in the business of directing the allocation of capital and of course, whenever the government directs the allocation of capital, it won't be economic criteria that are used. It'll be political criteria for the most part. How can we buy votes by, by making low interest loans to this or that industry or this or that region of the country? That's, that's what'll happen. Um, when, when I talk about this to my students, I, 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 even my example is getting dated now. I should come up with a new example. I, I, I ask them, just think about it. If, if in the late 70s, when uh, Microsoft was just being invented by Bill Gates dropping out of Harvard and, and uh, him and he and his colleagues creating Microsoft, what if it depended on government credit allo allocation, government capital allocation, not private capital? Um, and we did have a government agency like the RFC, which was eventually ended in the 1950s. Uh, and this, they were dependent on government capital, government uh, loans or preferred loans. And here are your choices. You're, an, you're a politician. Here are your choices of who to give the capital to. A Harvard dropout who looks like the geek of the year with the big glasses and the long hair and skinny and, and Bill Gates uh, and, uh, okay, and his buddies who all look just like him. And what are they doing? They're, they're messing around in his dad's garage in Palo Alto. Or IBM, give the money to IBM, or give the money to the company that's located in the district of the chairman of the House Ways and Means Committee. Who is likely to get that, that, uh, that low interest loan? It's, it's not likely to be the entrepreneurs in Bill Gates' dad's garage. Uh, I, guarantee, I guarantee you that. And so, but, so that's how political capital allocation takes place. And this, this was started by Hoover and so he uh, put a big distortion into the capital markets uh, by this. And it lasted until the 1950s when it became so corrupt that uh, it, was, it became such a big embarrassment that they ended it around 1955. They were making loans to, uh, I think the last straw was they were making millions of dollars of loans, of millions of dollars of loans to strip clubs. And, uh, and that was in the 50s, I guess that was uh, too much even for uh, uh, Eisenhower. And so, uh, 
And so, uh, so that ended it. But uh, the guy who was the head of it, was a man named Jesse Jones, wrote his uh, uh, autobiography called $50 billion. And the book is how he spent $50 billion. And it was all, and uh, I read that once, and it was, uh, he was bragging, he would say things like, we even loaned money on a, a drove of reindeer in Alaska. So I guess they were trying to buy votes in Alaska during the Great Depression. That was, that was an important thing, reindeer in Alaska. They need a capital subsidy. So that was, uh, that, that's what uh, Hoover was involved in. And uh, also there was monetary expansion, as I said, uh, uh, pretty, pretty severe monetary expansion from 21 to 29 that, that fueled the roaring 20s, helped the roaring 20s roar. But of course that created a, uh, a misallocation, uh, even bigger misallocation of capital, which, uh, which I think is what the main cause of the depression was. But then FDR comes along and of course I mentioned that this is a myth. I said that, that, that FDR cured the Great Depression uh, is, is a myth, uh, and you don't have to look very far to understand why this is a myth. By any measure of statistics that, uh, regarding the eco economic well-being that you could dig up, you could see that uh, the Great Depression never ended during Roosevelt's term you know, prior to World War II. Uh, in 1929, the average unemployment rate, the normal unemployment rate, was 3.2 percent. That was sort of the natural rate of unemployment at that time. Uh, but you know, as you can see, if you can read this, by 1940, it was still 14.6 percent. You know, almost five times the the, the normal unemployment rate. It was all the way up to 19 percent by 1938. And also, if you look at other measures such as per capita GNP. It was lower in 1939 than it was in 1929, and uh, per capita personal consumption was lower in 1939 than it was in, in 1929. So by, by any measure of economic well-being, uh, on the eve of World War II, uh, the Great Depression was still going strong, uh, despite all the New Deal programs that you've all heard about. And of course, N World War II didn't end the Great Depression, uh, because it's, it, it really is a joke, isn't it, to think that uh, okay, we're going to send 16 million men out of the country and then say, hey, no more unemployment. Aren't I, aren't I smart? I, I cured the unemployment problem. That, that doesn't cure the unemployment problem. In fact, standards of living continue to get worse because they had rationing of meat and price controls. And, and that's another thing with price controls. The economic statistics for the war years are really meaningless because the prices of all the goods that are measured in the GDP statistics are all government mandated price control prices. They're not market prices. So you, it's, you're comparing apples and oranges. You're comparing GDP uh, measured at market prices with GDP in this sort of centrally planned economy during the, during the Great Depression. And so those statistics on, on uh, economic activity during the, during the war years uh, really don't show you anything. It should largely be ignored. They're, they're just a mess. And, and, and anyway, logically, it just doesn't make sense that uh, uh, you know, when we talk about ending unemployment or ending a depression, you know, why do we want to do that? Well, we want people to have jobs and, and earn income and work and, and have a better standard of living, better, better housing, better nutrition. That didn't happen during the war. 16 million men were sent to the Pacific and the, into Europe to fight in the war. That, uh, that was not, their lives weren't better, their lives were worse. You know, many of them were, were killed. And so the Great Depression never did, did really end until after World War II, when uh, between 1945 and 1947, the federal budget, with the demobilization of the army, the federal budget in absolute dollars was reduced by two thirds. It was, it, was, it was from I think it was 92 billion to 30 billion uh, in that, that range. So it went from the 90 billion range to the 30 billion range in, in absolute dollars. And that, of course, all that money put back into the pockets of uh, investors and, and consumers, uh, that's what fueled the recovery, not, not these, uh, these programs. And so, so he never did end the Great Depression. Even though a lot of politicians to this day and, uh, and scholars think he did, including, uh, let's see if I can find this quote from the well-known economic scholar Newt Gingrich. I had one here somewhere. Where was that? 
Yeah, I should have I should have uh, dug it up earlier. Maybe I'll dig it up before the end. But I did have a, a quote here from from Newt uh, praising FDR for 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 ending the Great Depression, and uh, uh, and praising him to the treetops for that. Well, well, what did FDR do? What did FDR do? Well, uh, briefly, the first New Deal was basically a giant price-fixing scheme. Uh, the first New Deal, the, the hallmarks of what is called the first New Deal, uh, 30, 33 to 35, was the Agricultural Adjustment Administration, which was a massive scheme by the government to pay farmers for not growing food in various ways, uh, acreage allotments to, uh, to restrict the number of acres that it can legally be planted, and all in an effort to prop up the price, prices that farmers got and farm incomes, supposedly. Okay, so it's a cartel, a government-enforced cartel. And then there was the National Industrial Re Recovery Act that tried to do the same thing for the rest of the economy, to fix prices. There were, there were uh, price codes for all industries, and there were swarms of bureaucrats running around trying to enforce the price codes, uh, which was another cartel price-fixing scheme. As I said earlier, the, the basic theory that they had was the depression was caused by low prices. Therefore, if we can use price controls to uh, raise prices, we'll end the depression. They had it backwards, of course. Uh, the depression was not caused by low prices. The depression caused low prices. And, and uh, so they, they had it all backwards. And so, uh, and uh, Henry Hazlitt, who uh, we consider to be an Austrian, he certainly understood all this from the very beginning. And uh, I have one good quote from Hazlitt of how this of how this worked out. This was from the December 1933 issue of the American Mercury, um, edited by H. L. Mencken. Uh, Hazlitt wrote that uh, the American consumer is to become the victim of a series of trades and industries which in the name of, quote, fair competition, will be in effect monopolies consisting of units that agree not to make too serious an effort to undersell each other, restricting production, fixing prices, doing everything, in fact, that monopolies are formed to do. Instead of a relatively flexible system with some power of adjustment to fluid world economic conditions, we shall have an inadjustable structure constantly attempting at the cost of stagnant business and employment to resist these conditions. So Hazlitt, this is 1933, uh, he immediately understood what this was going to be, what this was going to be as it's a, it's a classic cartel scheme enforced by the government. Uh, even though we had any trust laws at this time supposedly designed to uh, prohibit this, uh, when the government does it, it's fine, it's, uh, it's okay. And so, and that's exactly what happened. So that was 1933. Um, it took the main, and Hazlitt is a well-known Austrian in school economist, took the mainstream of the economics profession until 2004 to understand this. So the Austrians were about 75 years ahead of, uh, of uh, the mainstream. And I say this because there was an article in the August 2004 Journal of Political Economy, which is one of the top, if not the very top, uh, peer-reviewed academic journal in the field of economics, either the American Economic Review or the JPE or all one and two in the eyes of most, most economists. And there was an article by uh, one of the editors uh, of the AEA, uh, 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 co-authors are uh, UCLA economists, Harold Cole and Lee Ohanian. And the article is called New Deal Policies and the Persistence of the Great Depression, a General Equilibrium Analysis. And you read this article, and there's a lot of math and economic models in it, but the authors are, they sort of express surprise at what they discovered by studying this period of the New Deal. And I'll read you what they, what they conclude. New Deal labor and industrial policies did not lift the economy out of the Depression. Instead, the joint policies of increasing labor's bargaining power, which I'm going to talk about in a minute, and, and linking collusion with paying high wages prevented a normal recovery by creating rents and an inefficient insider-outsider friction that raised wages significantly and restricted employment. The abandonment, of these the abandonment of these policies coincided with the strong economic recovery 
of the 1940s. So it took until 2004 for the, uh, uh, the mainstream of the economics profession to, to sift through the cloud created by all the mathematical models and the mumbo jumbo and the lingo of economics to take a look at what actually happened. And, and even then they can't just take a look at what happened. They have to create a general equilibrium model to, ex to explain what happened. And, uh, and the, it's, it's just these models, in my opinion, is why they, they never understood what the heck did happen. And uh, some of the language uh, that they use in, in economics is a good example of why it's almost impossible to understand things like the Great Depression if, if you become a general equilibrium modeler. Let's see if I can find a good one here. Oh, yeah, I, I wrote in one of my publications that the, the theory, the, some of the theories written up by people like these guys in, in the JPE, they sort of look at the, uh, the economy as kind of like a Frankenstein monster. And here's what they say. The weak recovery during the Great Depression, the weak recovery is puzzling because the large negative shocks that some economists believe caused the, the downturn, including monetary shocks, productivity shocks, and banking shocks, became positive after 1933. And so, now I read this, I hear shocks, and I, I just, in my warped mind, I, th I think of uh, the movie uh, Young Frankenstein, with Frankenstein <laughs> sitting there being, being shocked into life, you know, and that's, that's how economists talk. They try to shock the economy into life. And, uh, and he talked about negative shocks uh, caused the depression, and so they were sapping the energy from Frankenstein, laying there on the table with Gene Wilder hovering over him. And then, but he says, you know, uh, after 1933, these shocks became positive. What were these shocks? Government spending, uh, monetary inflation. So they tried to shock the monster into life. And guess what? It didn't work. You know, unlike the Frankenstein monster story where it did work, it did work. And so uh, they failed to shock the beast into a becoming a living being once again. And uh, how are they supposed to do, do this? Uh, with various injections of government spending or easy, easy credit. So they, they, tried, they tried shocking him and that didn't work, so they brought out the, the big needles and inject him and it still didn't work. Uh, and that was, and, and I'm not making this up. They're using these words, injection, shock, and, and, and then, and it was, they, he says, they say that they would ex have expected a roaring re recovery. <laughs> Maybe, maybe you haven't all seen the movie, but you know when when, he, when Frankenstein does come to life, he roars. Doesn't he make a big loud 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 noise? But, but it's it's just ridiculous. And so so you guys are PhD students in economics. You, you're you're just the beginning of having to learn all this stuff. And, and uh, yeah, good luck, uh, good luck to you. But I think it's because of that kind of nonsense that you know how many years ago there was a calculator from 1933. Here's old Hazlitt immediately recognize that this is a government cartel scheme. What do cartels do? They restrict output. What happens when you restrict output? You restrict employment too, don't you? That's exactly what you do. And so you create more unemployment, not, not less. And these guys just discovered that because they, for a brief moment they got away from their macroeconomic models and looked at a microeconomics book apparently and said, hey, look at this. There's a section on cartels here. Let's look, what does it say there? And they, and, and they, and they actually and they, actually, they got it. They, they got what happened. And so, so the first New Deal was all declared unconstitutional by the U.S. Supreme Court in 1935. Uh, but Roosevelt did get around a lot of it. A lot of his uh, uh, agricultural programs that were restricting production, he just started calling them soil conservation programs. We're, we're conserving soil. We're not, we're not restricting output and raising prices for farmers. We're conserving soil. So they, so they did that. Then the second New Deal, what's considered to be the second New Deal, is uh, uh, mostly a lot of labor legislation uh, that affected labor markets. It's primarily labor market legislation and a continuation of all the spending and the taxing with all the, the public works. I think there were between 10 and 11 million people who were given public works jobs. But of course, all that money to pay for those jobs had to be taken out of the taxpayers' hides and so there was a, a big diversion of employment that caused less private sector employment because of all that money taken out of the private sector and it, and it pumped up uh, government employment. Uh, 
and, uh, and, and to do all sorts of things. And so, but on net, it, it didn't increase employment. In fact, it always reduces overall employment because the private sector always spends the money better, more efficiently than the government does. And so on net, it would, redu it would increase unemployment. So we had the Social Security Act, which imposed a uh, Social Security payroll tax. That makes it more expensive to hire people. Uh, we had the, a minimum wage law, federal minimum wage law, unemployment insurance taxes, that makes it more expensive to hire people. We had the National Labor Re Relations Act, which greatly empowered labor unions in, in many ways. And I, I don't want to go over big, the big long list of the ways it did, uh, it did so, but we, had, we also had the Norris LaGuardia Act that was signed by Herbert, Herbert Hoover, and, but it was enforced vigorously by the Roosevelt administration. And one of the things that did, the Norris LaGuardia Act, was made it uh, very difficult, almost impossible, to do anything about union violence. It exempted uh, unions from, from uh, the normal prosecution for various types of violent behavior. Uh, they couldn't uh, get away with murder necessarily, but, but a lot of other stuff, uh, as long as they were engaged in uh, trying to get better wages and working conditions, the courts would often look the other way at what the things they were doing. So as a result, strikes were much more prevalent and because of the boost in union power created by all this legislation, in 1937 alone, and what's the unemployment rate is still almost 17% in 1936, uh, wages went up by uh, about 14% in 1937 alone, up uh, during, in the heart of the, uh, of the Great Depression. And so uh, and what that means is that uh, wh when you're in a depression, and consumer demand is falling. What is also falling is what we call the derived demand for labor. When there, when there are fewer customers, businesses uh, have themselves have a lower demand for labor to produce goods and services to cater to the customers. And so the only way to, uh, to minimize the, the disemployment effect of a recession is to allow wages to be flexible. If wages can go down, at least you'll keep your job. Uh, is one way of looking at it. If you can take a pay cut, at least you'll keep the job at a, at a lower pay. Hopefully it's temporary. But what was happening was the pay was being forced up, not only by the federal minimum wage law, but by the union power, at least in those segments of the economy, not necessarily universally, but the union part of the economy was a big part of the economy in those days, in the 1930s. And so rather than allowing flex wages to be flexible downwards, all the government policy was aimed at uh, pushing them up and that, of course, would cause even more unemployment uh, than, than would otherwise have occurred. And uh, Richard Vetter and Lowell Galloway in their book, Out of Work, uh, do this statistical analysis that they, they uh, estimate that the unemployment rate in the U.S. as a result of this legislation was about eight points higher than it would have been otherwise. So they're saying instead of 19% uh, unemployment in 1938, it would have been 11% in 1938. Or by 1940, instead of uh, almost 15 percent, it would have been it would have been about seven percent, and that's getting that's getting closer to normal. You know, normal was 3.2, three and a half percent, and so, uh, so even if even if their estimate is off, which they always are, it's still they they still show that there was a pretty big negative effect there as a result of this, and so so nothing <clears throat> nothing that Roosevelt did was good for the economy. The first New Deal was a giant cartel scheme that uh, was harmful to the economy. He raised taxes tremendously. Uh, public work spending, that was bad too. It took more money out of the economy. The second New Deal empowered labor unions for the most part, made it more costly to hire people. That created more unemployment. Uh, that's, uh, and so the cynics out there, including me, would, would argue that uh, maybe that's why he was so eager to get into World War II. All this, uh, you know, uh, seven years of uh, the New Deal uh, was a total flop. It didn't work. It didn't work. Um, there was also was quite, quite the pork barrel aspect of, um, of the New Deal. So all this spending, you know, those of you who have ever talked to your grandparents and, and your parents, some of you, uh, about uh, the New Deal, they'll tell you how grateful they were for these jobs they got. And now, if it wasn't for Roosevelt, uh, the family would have starved and, and that sort of thing. Uh, well, that's why we study economics, so you can 
so you can understand why your senile old grandfather is not right about this, and that you don't, <laughs> and that you don't go and tell your children the same story. Same story. That's why we study economics. But, but there's uh, fairly recently there's been some research <coughs> by public choice scholars like Bill Shugart and 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 one of his students, and and a few others on sort of the political economy or the public choice aspects of how this uh, how the money was spent. Um, the typical assumption is that, well, they did spend a lot of this money uh, um, out of the goodness of their hearts. They spent billions in other people's money to try to alleviate poverty during the Great Depression. So, you know, you can, you, you can make the case, I suppose, that, well, well, certainly somebody benefits from all this. You can't spend all these billions and nobody benefits. Somebody benefits. Um, and the question is, well, who exactly benefited? Was it the people who were made worse off? The South was the, the worst part. Uh, of the economy during the Great Depression, especially places like Mississippi. The Mississippi Delta was, uh, was an awful place economically to be in the, in the 1930s. And, uh, but there's a lot of evidence that um, the main criterion for this spending, get this, I'm not making this up, politics. You know, it, was, it wasn't, it wasn't uh, the alleviation of poverty necessarily. And for years, there have been a lot of anecdotes about this, but um, uh, modern scholars, well, economists in particular, have become, begun doing more systematic research. But let me give you uh, some, of these, uh, some of these anecdotes that illustrate how the money was spent. And, and, uh, this is from a, a United States Senate Committee on Campaign Spending. Republicans in Kentucky were told they would have to change party affiliations if they wanted to keep their government jobs. Uh, in Pennsylvania, businessmen who leased trucks to the uh, government were solicited for $100 campaign contributions. Uh, Pennsylvania government job workers, WPA workers, were told to change their party affiliation if they wanted to keep their jobs. Many people refused and were fired. Uh, Tennessee Works Progress Administration workers were also instructed to contribute 2% of their salaries to the Democratic Party as a condition of unemployment. In one di congressional district in Cook County, County, Illinois, the WPA instructed 450 of its employees to canvass for Democratic votes around election time in 1938. The men were all laid off the day after the election. So there's, for, even during the Roosevelt administration, there was a Senate investigation of how this money was used to buy votes, uh, first and foremost, not so much to, uh, to alleviate poverty where it was worst, and there's a book written by Bill Shugart and William Couch, who uh, it was, I think it was, it was Couch's doctoral dissertation at the University of Mississippi, where uh, Shugart uh, teaches. And uh, it's a statistical analysis of the spending of the, during the New Deal, of all the pork barrel spending. And I'll read you one of their conclusions. And uh, it's, I think it's, it's called The Political Economy of the New Deal, is the name of the book. It's an excellent book if you're interested in this topic. Uh, from an economic perspective of economics. They say the distribution of the billions of dollars appropriated by Congress to prime the economic pump was guided less by considerations of economic need than by the forces of ordinary politics. Perhaps the New Deal failed as a matter of economic policy because it was so successful in building a winning political coalition. FDR was reelected overwhelmingly in 1936 and again in 1940, in part due to the support of the big city machines, organized labor, and other constituencies, which benefited disproportionately from New Deal largesse. So that's where most of the money went, they found, to, to the people who would support um, the Democratic Party. And then he says, insofar as the, the region was safe for Democrats, the administration's comparative neglect of the nation's number one economic problem, the South, can likewise be explained by politics. The South was solidly Democratic. The Republican Party, after all, was the party of Lincoln. Nobody was voting uh, Republican, you know, hardly at all in the South, and so they were safe. They knew in those days that the South would vote Democrat. They're not going to vote Republican. And this, this was true until relatively recently, until 20, 25 years ago, that because of Lincoln, uh, the South was Democratic. And so they felt they didn't need to spend that much money there. Uh, they're in their pocket already politically, so why, why waste the money? Buy votes out in, in you know, California or someplace where, where they're the margins, the electoral margins are thin, and we need to uh, bribe people to vote with us, for us. And so that's what Shugart and Couch found was, was uh, the main determinant 
of all this spending during during the Great Depression, and so uh, and so that's pretty much my story about the Great Depression. That Herber, Herbert Hoover, if you study him, you read almost any book about him. He was a big interventionist. There's even a book about him called uh, I think it's called Herbert Hoover, the Forgotten Progressive, and where, where they argue that he fits right into the progressives, and which were the the socialistic interventionists of the early 20th century. He was just sort of the the last progressive uh, to achieve high office. Uh, when Hoover was, uh, he was the head of the U.S. Department of Commerce in the 1920s, and when he got there, he, he created 30 new departments and hired 3,000 more bureaucrats. And that, that's not a laissez-faire kind of guy. That's, that's somebody who thought he could centrally plan the whole economy through the, through the Department of Commerce. And one of the books I read about him says this made him very famous <laughs> because he was sticking his nose into almost every industry in, in America some way or another, and it's made him famous. That's got him elected president. He was an engineer, and he apparently believed that uh, since he was successful as a mining engineer, well, social engineering ought to be a snap. You know, <laughs> if, we can, if we can figure out how to get all that coal out of underneath those mountains, you know, the rest of society is nothing because it's darn tough underneath those coal mines. And so he was a big social engineer. And uh, you know, I might as well g dig out that exact quote from Re Rexford Tugwell. Rexford Tugwell, by the way, was a big admirer of Stalin. He, was, uh, he wrote a book uh, about, uh, on America's economy. I think it was called America's Economy in 1930, where he praised Stalin and, the, and Soviet central planning to the treetops and urged America to, to, uh, to be, become more like that. But here's what he said in, uh, in 1946, after Roosevelt was dead, uh, Tugwell, who taught at Columbia, said the ideas embodied in the New Deal legislation were a compilation of those which had come to maturity under President Herbert Hoover's ages. We all of us owed much to Hoover. So it was pretty much a continuation of the interventionism uh, of the Hoover years. And let me read you one of the things he says about uh, his admiration for Stalin, since I mentioned that. Oh, yeah, he said, uh, he stuck American Economic Life is the name of Tugwell's book, 1930. And he was Roosevelt's top economic advisor from 1932 to 1945, the whole duration. He said, Russia's, the Soviet Union's worst enemies are being forced to admit that the system appears to be able to produce goods in greater quantities than the old one and to spread such pr prosperity as there is over wider areas of the population. That's the Soviet Union. He said, Soviet planning enabled uh, them to, ca quote, carry out their industrial operations in accordance with a completely thought out program. Well, that's something different than what we do here, he was saying. And he says, uh, the major advantages of the Soviet program outweigh the disadvantages, even though the available evidence suggests that uh, there, there are admittedly those who suffer under it, under, under Soviet, this is 1930, uh, and the, the Ukrainians come to, would come to mind. Uh, so even though there are those who suffer under it, Tugwell said, the major advantages outweigh the disadvantages of the supposed loss of incentive under communism, the red tape, unimaginative centralized authority. So he put the word supposed in there. Uh, he, Tugwell said, well, there is a, quote, certain ruthlessness and disregard for liberties and rights in the Soviet Union, as well as repression, spying, and violence. So he does admit that. Uh, okay. But, uh, but still, the next line is, anyone interested in peace, prosperity, and progress must, in the coming years, devote much study and thought to Russia and the Russians, end quote. That's, and that was uh, two years before Roosevelt picked him as his top economic advisor. So, so you can understand why uh, they, they were clueless, I think, as to what to do about the Great Depression and why uh, Roosevelt himself was surrounded by people who wanted him to go much further in, in terms of interventionism. And, uh, uh, and he eventually did, I guess, with World War II. But that's all I'm going to say about this for now. We'll have time for uh, questions and comments. And, and brilliant commentary. I forgot to leave, include that. <laughs>
I have no comment. Um, my girlfriend's old high school, her teacher, her history teacher, said that if anyone in her class put for the co the cause of the end of the Great Depression, Roosevelt or World War II or uh, or the New Deal, then they would receive an automatic F for the course. Oh, really? If they if they gave Roosevelt credit for ending the New Deal, well, that sounds like a good teacher to me. And That's Carol, a I don't know if you know <laughs> Dr. Warren Carroll at all. Uh, I don't know. Uh, no, well, well, good for her. That's <laughs> she. She must have read my book. And, uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. Okay. Well, so that's good to hear. There's something good going on out there. Any other questions, comments? Uh, At the end of World War II, when uh, all Americans were celebrating, the, you know, the end of the war, the beginning of the peace, I'm just thinking that the changing economy through the time must have been having a, a hissy fit about the idea of demobilization and cutting back the government and oh, yeah. going right back into the Great Depression. Oh yeah, I have uh, when I, when I I teach a course in American economic history, and when I I usually have a couple of students who have, who have taken or at that semester will be taking intermediate macroeconomics, and, uh, and when I tell them that the federal budget was cut by two thirds in two years, and the and the economy took off, uh, I mean most of them think I'm lying. I think I, I have to I have to bring the statistical abstract in and show them the page. Uh, where it's where it says that because that totally flies in the face of Keynesianism. That is, yeah, you're right. They must have been in a panic, and uh, that's one of the reasons why the Keynesians uh, they advocated the GI Bill because uh, they thought with all these soldiers coming back uh, looking for jobs, it's going to be a disaster. Unemployment's going to be uh, you know 25 percent again. And so we need to get these these people and put them in school somewhere, use tax dollars to trade school, college, anywhere. And so that was, that was part of the Keynesian hysteria, I think, over <laughs> over the bad news of the war ending and uh, and, the, and and all this money going back into private hands, and uh, and of course, uh, you know, even worse yet would be if those people came back and started saving some of that money, right, for, from a Keynesian's perspective. If they came back and got it's bad enough that they got uh, started looking for jobs, but they started saving that money because the Keynesians, at least when I was in school, uh, the the textbooks always had a picture of a bathtub in the first chapter with uh, injections and leakages. And the leakages were bad. That was savings. You save your money if that's a leak. And uh, have you seen that in some of your books? It's a, it's a leakage, and that's not a good thing. It's like, it's like the blood is draining from your body. And, you know, somebody please plug the leak. Stop me from saving. So, uh, but in, even that, that had the, the unintended side effect of that. I wrote an article in the free market years ago called The Truth About the GI Bill, and I, I traced uh, a little bit about how it, it sort of led to the, uh, inevitably toward federal control of higher education, because the, the government started giving all this money to people to go to trade schools, and a lot of the trade schools were phony operations. They weren't a school after all. They were just collecting government checks and not educating everybody. And so the government said, well, that we have to monitor what goes on at these places if it's government money. And that led to the accreditation of higher education of, of colleges, and uh, and so uh, you know that has led to such things as I think in this article I mentioned a, a then current example of uh, I think it was Westminster Theological Ser um, Seminary, where which uh, their religion does not believe in the ordination of women as priests, and so the accredited federal accreditation agency came by and, and uh, said your academic programs are fine but we refuse to give you accreditation because you don't ordain pre uh, women priests and so they didn't they didn't like their religion therefore they wouldn't give them the accreditation and if you're not accredited you can't get your students can't get federal loans and, and, and that sort of thing and that that could have been ruinous and so they had at the time I wrote that they were going to court to sue because this could have totally ruined the place but that's uh, but I I see the GI Bill as the genesis of the uh, political correctness, the whole the whole mess, and so you can blame that on John Maynard Keynes if you uh, if you follow what uh, Mark is saying. But, uh, yes, sir. Is there been any uh, books written devoted to analyzing all of the history of legislation passed during the 30s in terms of the origins of it? Security? 
Yeah. Oh yeah, the Securities and Exchange Commission. Yeah, I didn't, I didn't mention everything, all that stuff. Oh yeah, there's been a lot uh, on, on that sort of thing. Um, yeah, I'll, I can dig up some references for you and give them to you. But um, uh, the best, a good reference is right outside that door. It's, uh, it's a book called Crisis and Leviathan by Robert Higgs. I don't know, you may already have that. I don't know, but he has. It's a good history of the, the Great Depression. You know, has n numerous chapters on that. I think he does mention the SEC, but it's not a book on the SEC. But uh, and I know uh, the, in the Journal of Law and Economics over the years, there have been quite a few articles by Chicago School scholars on the effects of the SEC. But, uh, historians still dislike Hoover for the wrong reason. General textbook painting as a, a laissez faire defender and, uh, with states that he sort of set back and did nothing wrong with us. According to uh, some historians who have uh, explored this myth, uh, because Hooper claimed that he was a uh, defender of laissez faire in his autobiography, and so the historiography has suffered in the decades since due to that. Uh, does, is this same myth present in the field of economics? And if so, how did it, did it get started? Oh, yeah, I think it is. Uh well, I quoted the great uh, economic theorist Newt Gingrich earlier, as, as, as credited him with saying that view. but. Um, well, that's probably how it got started. I don't. I'm not. I'm not sure. I haven't studied the uh, the uh, the whole history of that myth. But um, like I said, this this article in the Journal of Political Economy, it's. Uh, I just shake my head at this stuff. That's that's why it's. I mean, these guys. This is like uh, two of the top supposed top economists in the country from UCLA, writing an article in the year 2004, discovering for the first time that the Great Depression uh, or the New Deal didn't work. I mean, that's, that's the tone of the article anyway, and, and, that, and that's why it's published in this prestigious journal. It's supposed to be new, new research, you know, path-breaking research that didn't work. And so, you know, they, don't, they didn't seem to understand that because they have this, mind, this Keynesian mindset that all these shocks and injections is what eventually did end the Depression, and that Hoover's problem is he wasn't shocking and injecting enough, uh, apparently. So if you have that sort of Keynesian mindset, uh, that's the way, you'll, the way you'll think, but if you understand uh, Austrian economics or and or common sense, you, uh, <laughs> uh, you, you're not likely to think that way. And so, uh, yes, I think it still is. Uh, but economists don't write much about Hoover and the Great Depression. That's there's this belief among modern economists that anything older than maybe the last two or three issues of the top journals is really not worth looking at. And so, uh, apart from people like Bob Higgs and myself and and sort of a small band of people who are interested in economic history, uh, all the top journals, the prestigious journals, that they don't, they have no concern whatsoever for, for these topics. It's uh, it's too old. It's not sexy enough. It, uh, even though it's, uh, I think it's pretty important, pretty important issues. Who else? You had your hand up. Okay. Did you have a question? I was just going to comment that um, in Jim Powell's book, uh, Derek Pauly mentioned oh, Stiglitz's article. Oh yeah. Yeah. Well, that's right. Yeah, Steve. Uh, FDR is folly, which I don't know if it's for sale out here or not. But uh, by Jim Powell, he he does a pretty good chronology of the whole, all the F, all the alphabet agencies of uh, uh, the New Deal with with references in the back. So that'd be a good one. One of the big myths of the Great Depression is that the the Fed was doing everything absolutely correctly through the 1920s, and then. President Strong died, and they made mistakes after the Great Depression started. They, the Fed actually could have prevented the whole thing from happening in the first place. Yeah. <coughs> well, I think. Uh, <coughs> well, in my book, I, I think I think Rothbard had it right more, uh, and, and Friedman has it wrong with the monetary expansion. Uh, I think I think it's a good case of the Austrian business cycle theory, the, the Great Depression, explaining it. And uh, of course, Friedman's take is the opposite: that uh, the Fed was too restrictive. And that's what caused uh, caused the big crash, but uh, but I don't I don't uh, I don't buy his interpretation you know, myself. But yeah, that's another another big myth, I suppose, about the Fed. But it's 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 one of those things you're never going to convince the Chicago schoolers because they fundamentally don't believe the whole the Austrian analysis of uh, of the boom and bust cycle. So uh, yeah, one so. of the um, uh, one of the reasons that the mainstream 
understand the big question that they think of inflation as in terms of rising prices. And prices are fairly stable uh, 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 during the period that we say is inflationary, but that's, uh, that's because we see it as a counterfactual time. Right. In terms of, uh, where, the, where are prices higher than they would have been, so the natural falling rate, then you know, Hayek uses the term artificial price stability in terms right. of you know, the mainstream, I have no idea what that even means. But right. the question is not, you know, are prices rising, but are prices higher than they would have been were it not for this event? Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, yeah they do. Uh, it's even worse now because the uh, measurement of the consumer price index leaves so much out that we, we don't even know what uh, real prices are. You know, we've got housing and things like that. So it's, it's kind of like uh, how when the government some years ago decided it would be a good idea to put the Social Security off budget because when it was running deficits, it made the, made the budget look bad. So, so don't do anything about Social Security, but take it out of the unified budget so it doesn't, doesn't look as bad. Uh, changing the CPI is sort of the same way. So that's a good point. Uh, I had an economics professor with the Red Mountain and he came to me with important New Deal policies that the mainstream world had passed the age and the Jews and the general community of West Germany and that. Um, do you have any interest assessment or no? Uh, well, you know, as Bill Clinton would say, it all depends on how you define Keynesian. Uh, <laughs> Because uh, I, I don't know what your, who your professor is, but uh, uh, people like Paul Samuelson and James Tobin, uh, I've read them celebrating uh, Roosevelt for putting Keynesian-style policies in, into practice. And, and uh, so there are, there are different Keynesians that are probably more prominent than your professor, maybe Samuelson and Tobin, who, uh, who are big fans of uh, FDR. And I uh, wouldn't expect him to follow every exact prescription of the Keynesians. Um, there's a book by uh, James Buchanan and uh, Richard Wagner called Democracy and Deficit that they published, uh, so when they, it was published in 1976, I think. And uh, it's sort of an evaluation of what have the Keynesians wrought. And it talks about, uh, as all public choice analysis does, they lay out the textbook Keynesian prescriptions in a recession, I mean, cut taxes and or raise spending, and then just ask the simple question, well, what are the political incentives that politicians have? Uh, you know, will they cut taxes? No, they prefer to increase spending instead and run deficits instead, and that's what Keynesians will do, even though, uh, and they're not so inclined to cut taxes, even if that's the textbook <coughs> prescription. And so I'm sure people like, uh, Tobin, James Tobin, who's a Nobel Prize winning economist, along with Samuelson, understand that, even though they hated uh, the book by Buchanan and Wagner, and, uh, and, but uh, because they made them look kind of like fools, I think. And it's a really good book, though, but I recommend this book if you can find it. <coughs> it's out of print now, as far as I know, but it's, uh, it's, it's part of the collection. <coughs> part of the, the oh yeah, Liberty. That's right. He got Liberty Fund to spend all the rest of the money they had, I guess, on his collected works. Yeah, I, I, so, so, I, so I heard. <laughs> yeah, but uh, yeah, that's one of my favorite Buchanan books, along with Cost and Choice. That uh, it's, pr it's probably because Wagner uh, at the time was an Austrian, and he influenced uh, how that book was written a lot. And, uh, and uh, Cost and Choice is an Austrian book. Any other brilliant commentaries or uh, declarations? Uh, Yes, yes, sir. Why is the wrong people always right to disagree? <laughs> <laughs> the wrong people, well, one reason it has to do with money. Uh, one reason it has to do a lot to do with money. Mark and I were talking about this the other day with uh, some of the uh, people in the room, and that uh, the academic world is so overwhelmingly dominated by government and government money, the government universities, the research grants uh, are overwhelmingly from the government despite a few foundations here and there that support uh, uh, university research, they're just swamped by government. And so, and so uh, if you have a government job and you work for the government, you're not gonna be, you're not gonna be necessarily too blatant about uh, writing distorted history or pro-interventionist, pro-stated history, but you're probably not gonna ask the same questions in your research that somebody like Mark or me would ask in, in our research. You know, just leave them lie, you leave them go. And I've seen this in my career over and over and over again. And one of my very first jobs was in at the 
State University of New York at Buffalo, and I was publishing all these articles about how devious local politicians were in their setting their tax policies. And, uh, and I even had, I had my dean uh, tell me that I better watch it. It's kind of dangerous to be criticizing. And I was criticizing them in academic journals. And it's not as though the political hacks in New York State were reading the National Tax Journal or something like that, which they weren't. And uh, you know, an extreme example I gave some of the students the other day was uh, a man I know named Ed Krug, who was a soil chemist who was on a big government research team uh, to study acid rain in the 90s. And the research team, with scientists from all over the world, concluded it wasn't a big problem, acid rain. That's not what Congress wanted to hear. Ed Krug, being a naive scientist, went on 60 Minutes, the CBS television show, 60 Minutes, and explained to Ed Bradley what the scientists found. And as a result, his career was ruined. He showed me once a letter that the EPA had sent around to universities warning them not to hire him or else their grants would be pulled uh, because uh, they, wanted, they wanted this research to say the opposite, to justify the Clean Air Act amendments of the early 90s, and it didn't. Uh, they, they were honest scientists and said, good news, we don't need another Clean Air Act amendment. That's not, Cong Congress didn't want to hear that. So his career was totally ruined by that. And, uh, and a lot of that goes on in history and other fields. So, so that's, but that's my take on it, of why, uh, why so much uh, history is written by uh, status. Although I read the, I read the stuff because hist uh, good historians will have a lot of information in their books and articles, uh, but uh, we just look at it all from a different lens. If you, if, you, if you know economics, for example, you can look at some of the same historical facts and have different ideas about what they mean. So I wouldn't say don't read what they write. They're, most of the history books are written by leftists. But, uh, but educate yourself as well as you can and, st and still read these books. And then you can write books criticizing them. You know, you know equip yourself to, to answer them. But, uh, Tom, I just want to point out there is a kernel of truth in the idea that FDR got us out of the Great Depression because uh, when he died in 1945, if you look at the stock market, it actually started to go up at that point. Yeah, at least that's there's, his there's final act got us out of there. There's actually a statistical, what do they call it, break in the yeah. stock market trend at that point on the day he died. Yeah. And of course, when Truman replaced him, he threw out um, what he called the long haired Harvard group, the, the, the last of the. The Tugwell, the Tugwells yeah. of the, of the, of the crew, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, well, Bob Higgs, and some of Bob Higgs' work, is on, you probably read this, uh, he, he had a paper on uh, the effect of, uh, of the Roosevelt administration's haranguing of businessmen and threats to businessmen on investment. That they created a, the, this whole atmosphere, you know, even the creation of the SEC and the, and the investigations and everything, it created a great deal of uncertainty over capital investment. Uh, why, why should I invest my capital here if, if the administration is so threatening to me, this industry. And so he makes the case that a lot of investors held back for years uh, during the Great Depression years. And, but then as soon as these people cut this out, like you said, uh, Bob makes a pretty pretty good case. And he, he gathers as much data as he can on on uh, different aspects of the stock market and, and, um, and so forth to, uh, to make the case that uh, it, it was good. The investment took off because there was much less uncertainty. So I guess, uh, I don't know who would hold responsible for that, though. That's, uh, <laughs> FDR himself, I guess, he decided to call it quits. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's what these guys from UCLA said at the end of their article. As soon as this was all over with, that's when the economy took off. That's what Higgs says. That's what everybody else says. But this, the, the biggest myth, though, is that I think that World War II ended the Great Depression because uh, it literally did alter the unemployment statistic. But, you know... People were sent uh, to Europe and the South Pacific to fight in a war. They weren't. Uh, they weren't given jobs. Yep. Anything else? Anything else? Uh, well, maybe we'll call it call it quits for now. Then. Okay. Great. Okay. Thanks. I'd like to continue on my uh, my discussion of economic myths. Uh, I guess I could call these interventionist myths. Uh, and uh, and so I, I took on the big topic of the Great Depression. Uh, for this topic, and um, I think what I'd like to start with 
is uh, a discussion of what I call, uh, in my book on capitalism, called the, the American way of dealing with recessions, because it was the way in which uh, Americans uh, uh, dealt in terms of economic policy with recessions or depressions really until the Great Depression of the 1930s. And that was uh, basically to either do nothing or to deregulate. Uh, that was basically what, 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 what was done uh, by most, uh, most uh, administrations, most uh, government administrations to deal with in, um, recessions. And uh, a good example of that is uh, uh, President Martin Van Buren, who was president of the United States, uh, is elected in 1836. And uh, I'm going to read you just, just a couple of statements by Van Buren on his philosophy of what to do, because 1837 there was a big, a deep uh, recession, if not a depression, in, in the economy. So bad luck on his part. He gets elected, and, and this uh, recession uh, was just about to begin. And he said things like, all communities are apt to look to government for too much, especially at periods of sudden embarrassment and distress. And he was referring to this depression. And he said, uh, moreover, all former attempts on the part of government to assume the management of domestic or foreign exchange had proved injurious, uh, end quote. And so uh, all, all former meddling interventionism as a response to recession uh, made things worse. And he said what was needed was, quote, a system founded on private interest, enterprise, and competition without the aid of legislative grants or regulations by law, end quote. And that was a president of the United States saying that. And, and so uh, he, and he, uh, his actions were consistent with his words, uh, as is not always the case. Um, as uh, you know, Ronald Reagan was a great speech maker, especially before he became uh, president. And, uh, but his actions were often different than his speeches. And it's the same is true of just about every president. But in Van Buren's case, he stuck to his rhetoric. And, uh, and there was financial market deregulation that, that he uh, supported and helped get passed. Uh, for example, there, were, uh, there was a law, uh, and Jeffrey Hummel, I read, I read about this, I didn't know about this, I read about this in Jeffrey Hummel's book that I've mentioned several times. There was a law actually that forced commercial banks to buy some of these worthless bonds that state governments issued to finance so-called internal improvement projects the ones that were championed by Abraham Lincoln in, in Illinois, for example. They actually got a federal law forcing these banks to buy these, these bonds, which turned out to be useless. And so Van Buren uh, was instrumental in getting rid of that. Uh, there, were, there were banking regulations that prohibited branch banking, in, uh, as there were in the modern era. And he understood that that was a bad idea, too. So there was actually was financial market deregulation. Van Buren was an advocate of hard money. And he helped uh, 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 the creation, the eventual creation in the early 1840s of what was called the independent treasury system, which made uh, currency redeemable in gold and silver. Um, uh, there, were no imp there were no pork barrel spending. He, he didn't do what modern presidents always have done, especially beginning with Roosevelt and Hoover, his predecessor is spend money like crazy on road building or canal building. He was opposed to the so-called internal improvements projects financed by taxes, and, uh, and, and he vetoed any bills that came across his desk to spend tax money on, on this sort of thing. There was no fe federal bailout of state governments, even though the state governments to engage in uh, uh, work sharing, which is sort of a socialist idea of uh, instead of having 10 people working 40 hours a week, why don't you hire 20 people and have them work 20 hours a week? He thought that would reduce unemployment. But of course, the only way to reduce unemployment is through more production. Uh, that's the only way to do it. This is just rearranging the chairs in the Titanic uh, work sharing, sort of a socialistic idea. Um, uh, unlike Van Buren and other predecessors, uh, Herbert Hoover uh, started the, the binging on pork barrel public work spending. It wasn't Roosevelt that, that initiated this, it was Herbert Hoover. He spent 13% of the federal budget on public works alone in, in, the, in, in the first couple of years of his administration. And of course to do that he had to raise taxes enormously. Uh, so we had some of the biggest tax increases in American history up to that point uh, under Herbert Hoover. And, uh, and Murray, Murray Rothbard's book, America's Great Depression, is a great resource on uh, on Herbert Hoover, it's it's a basically a, a, about the, Her the Hoover administration for the most part.
And if you want to read up about all the tax increases and so forth, that's, that's where to find it. Uh, it was Hoover who started the business of farm, government supervised farm co cartels, the, the business of paying farmers to not grow food, uh, to not raise livestock and so forth. That started with Her Herbert Hoover. Now, you don't have to be a, a PhD student in economics to understand that if the problem is unemployment and the government is taking one big sector of the economy, farming, and is paying people not to hire farm workers and to not provide, may, uh, grow food, that that's not going to be good for, for reducing unemployment. <laughs> He's paying people to not hire farm workers. That's essentially what they were doing. Uh, that's why these, these programs that continued in a much larger degree were uh, in pretty bad shape financially. Uh, the Van Buren administration cut federal spending in absolute dollars by 21%. From 1836 to 1840, the federal spending actually declined by uh, 21%. There were no price controls, and uh, he did what he could to move closer to free trade. He was a free trader and did, did what he could to open up trade. And so as a result, it was, it was a, a deep recession, but very short. It didn't last that long. And, and that was the, what I think of as the American way of dealing with recessions. Uh, they didn't do much, uh, probably because macroeconomics hadn't been invented yet. That's probably the main, main reason that uh, there, there was, they had no, no philosophical rationale for doing otherwise. And plus, they had a lot of bad experience to point to, as Van Buren did, they, did, they might not have had a theoretical framework, but they had a lot of bad experience with interventionism. And so, well, anyway, Her Herbert Hoover, let's, I mean, I'm supposed to be talking about the Great Depression. Um, probably the biggest economic myth there is, is that laissez-faire capitalism caused the Great Depression and uh, interventionism in the New Deal cured the Great Depression. Uh, false, not true. Uh, the, the Hoover administration was anything but interventionist. Uh, and there was a great bit of, mo a, a lot of monetary expansion in the 1920s. The uh, money supply increased by almost 70% during that, during that decade. And I'll, I'll talk about the ramifications of that in a minute. But, you know, Herbert Hoover is credited with being a laissez-faire, advocate of laissez-faire capitalism. And if you read some of the things he wrote after he got out of office, they were they were pretty good. They you know they could be published by the Mises Institute even, and and of course he used some of his wealth to help to found the Hoover Institution in California, but like a lot of other politicians, even uh, I think we were talking last night, even Thomas Jefferson, uh, who was you know philosophically was great before he was president, but once he got in office, the the pressures of politics changed him. You know he he had, he had to if he wanted to succeed as a politician. He had to compromise, and that's what politicians do. So he wasn't that good of a president in my eyes, but he was. But his political philosophy was was tremendous, uh, and the same is true with Hoover. But if you look at what he actually did and what he stood for policy-wise, it was interventionism. He was a progressive. He was not a he was not a capitalist, an advocate of laissez-faire. Uh, what did he do? Well, he pressured businesses to raise wages during when, when the economy was slowing down near the end of his his uh, his term. Pressured. Now, when you say government pressures somebody, uh, I think of it as uh, uh, or negotiates with somebody. I always think of it as gun under the table negotiation. There's always some sort of hidden threat there. Either you do what I'm suggesting, or something bad's going to happen to you. Uh, you'll be audited. Or yeah, there are, you know, I'll go. I'll sign this law that will tax, put a special excise tax on your industry, so, something like that. So when you when you you know when you negotiate with government, it's never an, an even negotiation. And so and he held hundreds of conferences, literally hundreds, with different trade groups, industry groups, to try to get them to raise wages. And this was essentially the agenda of labor unions that that Hoover was promoting. And all of this was codified during the Roosevelt administration by labor laws that changed. Uh, but so, in fact, in my book, I quote Rexford Tugwell, who was uh, FDR's chief economic advisor from 1932 to 1935, as saying that most of the ideas for the New Deal came from Herbert Hoover. They just, they just went further and codified in law a lot of the things that he was trying to get done somehow through pressure or persuasion, uh, bribery, you know, threats. That's what politicians do.
Uh, he, had, he also pleaded with business people 